Unlike um, Myanmar and Zimbabwe, who have some basic data, in Nigeria there is absolutely lack of some data, especially on the most marginalized group. But we have basic demographics that suggest that uh, the population of uh, the, the population is skewed towards less than 18 years. That means less 18 years and below are more than 50% of the population. That's why we have this target on boys and girls, especially the adolescents between 13 and 19 uh, in their teens and uh, other marginalized group. Um, also, the last uh, multi-indicator survey, which was randomly done, could not place a, a particular statistics on number of disabled people, but it talks about several of them and in several forms scattered all over the country. Uh, with the work CA Christian Aid have done in Nigeria in few, uh, for the past 10 years, uh, uh, there have been some arrangement that led us to have some concentration in Anambra and Karuna State because they have been their pilot state for various di uh, different programs. And in those two states, there have been some few emerging data on the target group that's the most marginalized group. Uh, the last study shows that uh, about 33% consider themselves not being empowered socially, consider themselves are empowered socially, politically, and economic uh, in, in Kaduna State, while that reduces to 26% in Anambra State. So that is why our study is is somehow not just targeting and at disabled people, but looking at the most marginalized, which we have in three groups as one, uh, the adolescents, boys and girls between the ages of 13 and 19, then people living with disability and the poor rural women, not just all women, but the poor rural women who are living in hard to reach communities. Uh, in these two states. So, um, uh, with regards to uh, this particular set of groups, uh, every generic studies have shown that they have problem in accessing basic services, especially in education, health and, and water resources. And that's why our focus is on access improvements to basic service delivery true voice for the most marginalized groups, which now is the topic of what we are trying to investigate. Because we have seen that it is not just asking governments to do, there is need for them to also be part of the uh, uh, campaign to improve services for their use. There are quite a number of challenges, like I have mentioned. There is no dedicated data platform for the project with all stakeholders and the uh, government restriction on making that available to the public is also affecting a lot of uh, research that are being done in this part of the world. Um, there are also problems as uh, whenever a donor, a research institution is coming up with this kind of sensitive issues, government see, perceive them as so position and all that, and they try to do everything to frustrate your efforts. There are also cultural issues, religious beliefs, which have made these people not being able to have access to basic services. And uh, some stakeholders still don't believe that they can become change agents. And that's the reason why we said, OK, let's delve into this. And that gave, to the, to gave rise to the three major objectives and the research questions the study will be focusing on. First is to generate and use data because we have to generate those data since they are not there and use them uh, to be able to amplify the voices of this most marginalized uh, at the state level and the local government level, even at the national level, if possible. And also to be able to identify key issues that are hindering responsive, the responsiveness of government in the need of the most marginalized group. Why are they not targeted? targeted interventions to make sure that these 
people are brought at par with others. It doesn't mean that there will be a wall, but at least they have the basic services they, they require. Um, there are some uh, World Bank studies that say that Nigeria has become the capital, uh, poverty capital of the world. Uh, and that is not an interesting and a commendable uh, um, uh, um, tag to a country with approximately 200 million people living in them. In fact, the last statistics shows that over 93 million living in extreme poverty. So that's why we are going to use these three objectives and three research questions to see how we can build a reliable database of key indicators so that public policymakers can now have something to latch on when making policies. Those are the reasons that informed our study. We differ, differ a bit different, a little bit from that of Myanmar and um, Zimbabwe that are that have clear basic statistics so they won't know what they want to do. So we want to build that reliable database uh, with government and non-government actors that everyone will accept and uh, uh, to help and use that to amplify the voices of these most marginalized and also improve policy making at the, um, at the local and state level. So our research questions are looking at those processes that will ensure that these data are generated and also they are reliable. And how do we make sure that we manage them effectively? And uh, that's the main research questions. And the three sub research questions look at the need in building a reliable database with relevant indicators. There are indicators that are striking that when you see uh, I, I remember in a workshop two weeks ago, somebody said Nigeria is the poverty capital. Another body said, and what does that mean? Because he doesn't understand. He said, what are the indicators that shows that Nigeria is, is the po uh, poverty capital? In fact, he made a strong argument. He said, everybody is carrying a smartphone. And how can you now claim that this is the uh, world poverty capital? So we want such smart, re relevant indicators to be able to show that yes, these particular most marginalized are, are here and they need something to get them out of the woods. Then the second uh, sub questions is looking at uh, understanding why government's responsiveness have not been the way it should be. What are those things that are inhibiting them? We are going to identify those factors and how do we make use of this data in such a way that the marginalized groups can have their voice amplified and this public service can be get can get to them in the two focal states. In the two focal states of Anambra and Kaduna State, we have four local governments each, which we are going to work on. Uh, we are listed, they are listed above. I don't want to mention them because some of us may not be able to pronounce them. And then um, Three major issues that are going to be our conceptual will revolve around three major issues. One is to know what do we mean by most marginalized groups and how we arrive at that. I've already mentioned them, but we are going to explore that further. And uh, what we mean by public services, uh, like I mentioned before, so we are focusing on three, education, uh, four, education, health, agriculture, and water, water resources, water, wash, water, sanitation, and hygiene. Then relevant indicators, like I said, there are indicators that are convincing. There are others that are confusing. So we are going to man, uh, maintain the convincing indicators, uh, identify them with the help of all the stakeholders, both government and non-government actors, to be able to identify such indicators that will help us push policy towards understanding why these guys are most marginalized and what needs to be done to get them out of the world. And in doing that, we helped, we will help to build a database that will be acceptable to both government and private citizens, as well as non-governmental organizations. Um, the literature, we are going to explore all the literature, not just in Africa, on this area, uh, focusing on those three target groups, especially uh, hard to reach areas where we don't have much literature. We are going to also explore looking at so many other issues 
that will help us know what has been there and what has not been there. Not just in Africa, we're also looking at other developing continents like Asia and uh, Latin America to see how they have been able to approach this subject and gain insight from there to be able to also uh, add value at the end of the day, not just having a literature that is robust, but also add value to the body of uh, the body of knowledge in the subject area. So we we'll look at OK, we look at literature on exclusion and uh, the role of data existence and how data existence can help improve policy and also literature on accountable governance. We have a framework for developing citizens voice and accountability from Fletcher Tembo 2020, 2012 as our uh, theoretical framework, which we will explore to be able to answer the questions, the where, the why, the data collection methods, and so on. Primary data, like I said before, then secondary data from few studies that have been done, and also the baseline, ECID baseline survey we had, which we did in 2020 in Nigeria. The research population will be this marginalized group which we have defined, and um, the sample will be drawn from the population which we have stated in agreement with the balance of theory and practice. Um, we are looking at different subgroups in the population, though it will be prob problematic, but we may target and manage them, especially as it regards to uh, gender and others. Yeah, that's where the target comes, so that it will not be either male dominated or female dominated. And sampling appro approach tentatively, we are looking at stratification stratification, but we hope to still explore and uh, see whether there are other sampling techniques that are better than that. Analysis will be done using just uh, not just a uh, descriptive, but also we have inferential analysis because there are some why questions which we must explore, especially when it comes to issues that have been inhibiting governments in uh, answering to the needs of the marginalized group. The impact of COVID will also be part of the issues we will explore in making sure that we answer all these questions. So the, basically the research method is looking at survey where we, which we will use to generate primary data, also review literature to generate secondary data and also the baseline reports. There will be interview of program staff of uh, Christian aid and other key government and non-governmental partners who are going to be part of this. Uh, why we have a lot of focus group discussion with different targeted groups. Uh, we are introducing another thing which is what is very uh, interesting very, these days in getting so many information. There are some tertiary stakeholders who you may not be able to get directly, but with targeted radio funding programs, we'll be able to get them to also share their insights on the subject matter. Um, in terms of um, audience, we are looking at the state and local government policy makers as the basic target for our findings, uh, to make use of the findings, but international development partners, donors and tertiary stakeholders, as well as the world of academia and civil society, are going to also be benefiting from the uh, these the findings of the studies because we believe there will be a kind of rejigging of the policies after the study and um, this we hope to achieve using our policy briefs and discussion papers that will come out of the study. Uh, in terms of ethics, I did not supply anything on ethics in the main uh, document, but we now have our ethics. Uh, the university has a standard policy on research ethics, which we are going to adopt fully to avoid plagiarism, falsification of data, abuse of confidentiality, suppressing or distorting contradictory data, deceptive publication, attribution and gross negligence, violation of reg research reg regulations and so on. We are going to make sure that all those things do not happen. And the university has uh, what we call the HECC, which is where any study that has to do with human must report. We are going to uh, report there. 
uh, and also get approval at every particular point in time from the study, from the questionnaire level, from the proposal stage, and everything will be submitted to them for approval before we we move on. Um, there, there's going to be consent from every uh, human that will be participating in the study, and also we assure them of confidentiality of the information they are supplying as far as the do no harm policy, which we don't joke with. We will make sure that all of them are there. Uh, there is going to be a desk officer with the research team uh, who will be uh, communicating with all partners and um, questions and answers and inputs and comments can also be thrown to him. We will have a hotline which we will also advertise so that people who have issues or who have questions can also ask and know where we are. And um, like I said, all protocols and questionnaires must be sent to the research office of the university for review and approval before they are going to be used. We have a special policy uh, that, in, that before you do any research that involves pregnant women, prisoners, children, and the disabled, especially, and also the aged, you must also obtain approval especially all the vulnerable groups. So all these things will be done. And in line with our ethics policy, uh, we are going to ensure that records of consent forms are kept for at least a period of three years after the completion of the re uh, research, so that if there is need for any, any follow-up or any questions that are coming up, we'll be able to tackle that. The university policy expects that research will also be published and um, with the help of uh, Christian Aid and all those, we know that it's going to be published. We've just made a contact to the chairman of the HECC, which is the Human Experiment Experimentation Ethics Committee, and we have put him in the know that there is a research coming up, which we are doing in collaboration with Christian Aid, and he's gladly waiting for us to submit the proposal for the approval. I just, I'm just winding up. So <laughs> with this, I think um, I have, um, I have tried to uh, cover most of the things. The other one is the uh, the timeline, which is standard, and also uh, those that are going to be the stakeholders, like we have identified before on in week six. We have the primary stakeholder, the secondary stakeholders, and the tertiary stakeholders, which we have grouped into people that have influence, people that we align with, those that will monitor, and those that will keep informed throughout the research process. Uh, I think I've been able to summarize our, uh, our proposal. Thank you very much.